thank you so much for that kind introduction and for the invitation as well. Wow, today's been really amazing so far, and Laura and I are really looking forward to learning from you all in our remaining time together, and I'm going to pass it back to her. Hi, all. Yes, thank you uh, for having me here with you today. I'm happy to be here and a part of this conversation. Um, my first task up is just to draw your attention to our three central aims we plan to address in this talk today. Um, and I have the great honor of acknowledging our collaborators who could not be here with us today. Um, so first we have Laurel Genova. She was an undergrad researcher that worked with us on this project and is actually an elementary education major. Um, and we also have Marsha Klepper, uh, also known as Kathy's mom, who is an instructional designer at the University of New Mexico. Um, and we just really want to start right from the top and acknowledge these collaborators and that this project and this talk included would not have been possible without these great collaborators. All right, perfect. <laughs> um, so now, I, as Kathy and I were planning this talk and as we were doing this work, um, I, we kept coming back to this idea of a sociologist and a chemist walk into a conference room. And honestly, it just sounds like the great uh, setup to a joke, right? Uh, like, what's going to happen? Uh, but the reality is, that's actually how our collaboration got started. In fact, if you look really closely in this photo, you'd have to probably get a magnifying glass. I am in this photo. Um, and what you see here is a campus-wide event that was bringing um, people from all disciplines and all departments on campus together to talk teaching and research, right? Um, and if you've ever taken part in any of these conversations on your camp campus, you might have ran into one of the first things you do in these conversations and the first question that comes up, what's your research area? Um, and certainly, right, if you initially just go, what's your research area? Um, and someone says chemistry or chemistry education um, and sociology, you may go, okay, cool, right? Nice, nice meeting you, handshake, and we're out. But as Kathy and I learned in our own collaboration, uh, a second question we might ask is, how do you answer your research questions? And this question is really what guides our collaboration and what laid the foundation for us to kind of figure out, oh, right, we actually have a lot of really great skills that pair well together. Um, so a sociologist and a chemist walk into a conference room and walk out with a collaboration. <laughs> uh, Great. And so for those of you who don't know much about sociology, and for those of you who do, um, this is just a very brief glimpse into some of the work that sociologists do. So it's a word cloud, right? I love a good word cloud. I hope you do too. Um, but it gives a brief overview of some of the highlights, right? Some of the disciplines, the sub-disciplines, excuse me, that we do work in, some of the methods that we use. Um, and if you want to take a quick moment to just look over the words highlighted here, or if you know a lot about sociology, some of the other stuff you know that maybe isn't highlighted, and do any of these words resonate with your own research and or teaching? Um, so have a quick think, and if you would, go ahead and drop your uh, kind of words that resonate with you in the chat, and I'll kind of read a few out. I'll give you all about 30 seconds to take a look, and if you feel so inspired, drop, drop your ideas in the chat of what might resonate with your teaching and research. Um, and if you're not able to join us in the chat, feel free to use that Miser21 hashtag on Twitter, and we'll, we'll look, for the, look for you there, too. Uh, try to get everyone involved. Great, lots of conversations rolling in, um, analysis, culture, inequality, family, identity, absolutely. Overall methods, qualitative, right? A callback to our talk that we just had, um, and absolutely quantitative, yes. Sociologists often use both um, and have training in both, race, theory, okay. This is wonderful. We could do this forever, right? But it underscores kind of this stepping back and thinking critically about how do so two disciplines that on the surface may not immediately have overlap, as we can see in the chat, absolutely do. Um, and I'll throw it over to Kathy now to talk a little bit more about kind of breaking down the barriers of those disciplinary silos. 
Thanks, Laura. So yeah, so we often, as Laura mentioned, or hinted at at least, that we represent the academy as distinct silos that can present barriers to interactions. Just like these silos shown here on a farm, I think, separate wheat from, say, corn. So the strategy that Laura just shared with you all of asking others what research methods that they use can be a nice low stakes way to find common ground with others who might be in different silos. Now, we do want to acknowledge that some of you are already perhaps really good at crossing disciplinary boundaries. For example, graduate students in CER programs might be in interdisciplinary courses or even taking courses in other departments like maybe education, statistics, psych, or even sociology. But others of us might not find these connections as readily, and this is even highlighted in this quote from the Deber report from 2012. This can be to, due to a lot of reasons, um, maybe the structure of our institutions or even the culture of our departments. And this idea of finding ways to make interdisciplinary collaborations has been brought up as a topic of interest in CER conferences before this, including the 2019 Gordon Research Conference and even last year's MICER. But without making assumptions about the room, let's just take the temperature of our group by uh, thinking about your own collaborations, and if you would share in the chat if you are not currently collaborating outside the, dis outside of the discipline, maybe if you're seeking, <laughs> and if you are, maybe sharing uh, what discipline you are uh, collaborating with. And we'll just take a couple of seconds to let the chat roll, and we're also looking at Twitter as well. Okay, so we're seeing some stuff rolling in. So some are saying not yet, but would like to. Okay, good. So biology ed research, education and physics. We're seeing some biophysics, computer, nice. Some more BER, math, awesome. Ed psych, it's rolling through now. We all can kind of read together, but I'm saying these out loud in case you're watching this video later. Uh, good, pedagogy across disciplines. Oh, I love it. Okay, so keep those rolling in, but what's great is that we can see that we have a range of experiences in this room. Always happy to collaborate, love that. So we'd like to get, take um, and use the opportunity and the expertise in the room and maybe the interest in the ro room to explore this idea of crossing disciplinary boundaries by breaking our own virtual boundaries right now and going out into a breakout room. So this is gonna be a short one, about five to six minutes just to start our discussion about bridging disciplinary silos. And then when we come back, we'll utilize the chat and also Twitter to share your thoughts for a few minutes. We're going to be doing a big kind of summary at the end of their uh, discussion points or maybe some key ideas coming back. We're not going to, we're gonna take just a couple minutes to share things in the chat and we are gonna do a big debrief at the end. Um, but before we go on, let's see where we're at because I know in our room, we had some great things coming out so um, the ex Deber conference, bringing people together, great. Oh, overcoming imposter syndrome. Ooh, I'm not gonna get too personal right now, except yes, that was, there was some aspect of that even coming here today for myself. So um, yeah, it takes uh, a while to pluck up the courage to ask if we could work together. Great point. Was that from Jackie? I think so. Um, <laughs> Great, scrolling through. Yeah, difference in required standards. All, <laughs> computer, computing colleagues always want higher sample numbers. Mm, yeah, we're seeing some likes and feel free to, to use those, those likes to up comments for sure. Understanding of the same word, absolutely. And if there are actually university conferences to go to. Yeah, so some of you have uh, cross, pe uh, cross university pedagogy groups, that's fantastic. Uh, reading outside of CER journals, great idea. Um, but it's tricky because, you know, a lot of times we just say, oh, go do these things. Um, but it's uh, it takes uh, more than just going and doing the thing. There's a lot of things in the way sometimes. Yeah, social media. Yeah, if you are not on Twitter, I uh, highly recommend. It's been really integral for both Laura and myself in uh, getting to know folks and just learning what other people are doing. And you can see our, our handles here. So feel free to say hi to us on Twitter. Crashing department seminar, uh, education department seminars. That is awesome, great idea. Okay, so keep throwing things in the chat and we're going to have a, um, 
Reader's Digest of others. Yeah, great idea, Michael. <laughs> um, we're going to have some reporting out uh, opportunities to share everything back with everyone so we don't have to just capture the chat. But I am going to move us forward right now. Oops, I need to take control. I am learning Teams, too. Oh, man. Yeah, Stacy, the annual evals. Ugh, we need to come back to that at the end for sure. Um, but first, uh, let's uh, look back at our session outcomes. We're actually going to move forward for just a few minutes on outcome one and two, which are focused on student experiences. And in particular, we're going to be turning to our uh, paper that was part of the pre-reading. So the work, and it's cited again here, uh, really came out of discussions that Laura and I were having about our March 2020 pivoted classes, as well as observations that I was making during April 2020 uh, registration for my May-June online class. So potential students were asking different kinds of questions about my summer, uh, my May-June online uh, lab course for non-majors, and this made us wonder how we might explore the guiding question that's shown here. Uh, I should point out that I did, we already had an open study with ethics approval, so I filed an addendum uh, to allow for a few additional questions specific to that pivot to remote instruction, and it was approved. And around the same time, the call for papers came out from JCHEM Ed. So Laura and I thought that maybe others might benefit from what we learned about our own population. And just to, to re-link back to what Laura said at the beginning of the talk, this would not have happened without our collaborators at all. Um, but especially Laurel Genova, our undergraduate researcher's willingness to work with us remotely on this project. And I'll talk about her specific contributions in a few minutes. But I'm going to throw it back to Laura to get us going on data and methods. Absolutely. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so as Kathy mentioned, um, this is really, I guess, the paper that brought us here. And so we wanted to make sure we talked about it. Um, so I'm going to get into the sample and the data. Um, it's interesting that in some of our conversations in the breakout room I joined, one of the things was, you know, collaboration, right? We need people who have statistical knowledge, right, and different training. And that's kind of came into play here, right, that my background um, in some more quantitative methods as well as qualitative is really useful. Um, so our data for this paper came from uh, four cohorts, student cohort years. So we have four years of data, essentially. Um, from that Chem 110 online course that Kathy just mentioned. And for the data itself, we actually have pre and post data for each cohort. So students were asked, um, given the survey, before the course and after the course ended. So we have pre and post for each year. Um, and that data included some Likert scale questions and some OVID ended questions as well. Um, so you know, we ended up with about 180 students across all years, so our total sample um, is about 180 students um, and an average of about 50 students per cohort year. Um, so to really get at our questions that we'll get into just some, in just a moment, we ended up with a really nice mix of quantitative and qualitative data. Um, so in a moment, I'm going to talk through just some of our kind of baseline quantitative analyses that we conducted to inform our paper. Thank you, Kathy. All right. Um, so our questions were, our quantitative questions were really driven by the seven questions that you see here on students' perceptions of their learning, and again, using the pre and post data. So our first kind of analysis here was to use some paired sample t-tests to look at that pre and post data and see, you know, are we seeing significant differences or a change, right, in the, the sample sizes that we had, and just kind of establishing a baseline here. Um, and what we found across each of these questions is that things were pretty consistent. Um, so that there were significant differences between that pre and post data within each student cohort that kind of tell us, right, the good news, right, students are getting more comfortable with experimental data, more comfortable with analyzing data, et cetera. Um, and so that was established in a baseline. And we see this kind of um, stability over time in these responses. The only slight difference we saw was that with our 2020 cohort, that post-disruption cohort, so they were our cohort that came, right, kind of post-disruption or that kind of March 2020 here um, when they pivoted, they 
did not have significant differences in the pre and post data for question six on knowledge of science help makes, helps make better citizens. So this could be a data blip, right? We're not reading too much into it, but we are intrigued if there's something here, just given some, you know, conversations around science taking place in society. So, you know, keep an eye on us for a potential, right, future paper as we watch that data and, and collect more. Um, the second level of analysis that we did here was to look at and compare the cohort years, right? So we wanted to check and see, are our 2019 students looking drastically different than our 2020 students? And that was one of our initial things, like, will our 2020 students statistically look different um, with, again, kind of the data that we have and can check? And what we found is that our 2020 students, those post-disruption students, did not look significantly, significantly different than their peers, right, across the earlier cohorts. So this suggests that that pivot didn't drastically change their perceptions of their student learning as measured by the questions here, kind of their outcome questions. Um, and really what that told us was, you know, there's nuance to be had here, but we need to take a closer look using that qualitative data and dive more into how the students are actually experiencing Experiencing and learning through the course. And for that conversation, I will throw it over to Kathy. Thanks. So yeah, so for the qualitative part of our study, we were exploring responses to the two questions that are shown here on the slide. Uh, at last year's MICER, Allison Flynn talked about entry points for undergrads. So I want to highlight that Laurel, the undergraduate researcher, came in at this point. The study had been designed. She was, of course, written into the addendum so she could work with the de-identified data, but she wasn't part of the, the sort of, of the design of things. Um, so she came in and got coding practice with me, and then she and I individually did our initial coding and codebook development, and then through our negotiated agreement, we ended up taking a consensus approach of both doing separate coding and then doing frequent check-ins and going through everything um, code by code. Uh, and when we were looking at the themes that were emerging, we wanted to then, at the end, after we did that, look back at the years to see if there were any changes in themes or theme prevalence over those four years. I've also included some additional strategies for working with undergraduate researchers um, that we can talk about more, perhaps in the time after this talk. <laughs> Uh, and then in the interest of getting to another breakout session, I just wanted to throw up um, our table of contents image to summarize our key findings from the qualitative piece. Everything shown here were valued by students as being important to their success in the online course for all of the four years. Uh, the ones on the right were relatively stable for all four years. And then these two had some differences for the 2020 students. The 2020 students valued communication far more than the earlier cohorts, and then valued feedback just slightly less. So, um, and this might just be for our population, but maybe it has applicability to others as well. Spending more time on feedback, more time on grading, <laughs> is actually less important to our students for their perceived success in the course than being careful, clear communicators. And also, the mode and the frequency of communication didn't emerge as a particular recommendation, just the consistency. So basically, do what you want, but just be consistent about it. And then finally, I just want to put up a quote from the paper from a, a, student, a student response. For some reason, students feel like online courses will be easier, but that is where the problem starts. Uh, Laura and I have been in person all year at Mercer, but we know that many or most of you haven't and have been online, so maybe this resonates with your own experiences, but, but really we've included it because it underscores the importance of a solid communication plan with other students. Okay, and so Laura is going to take us into our next breakout session. Right, are we good on time for that, Catherine? I just want to check in and make sure. Catherine, our captain. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we, we've, got, we've got time to do that. I'm just, uh, right, I'm going to start the breakout rooms and send, whisk you all off. All right. Um, so as she's getting those open, um, our prompts are there. We will also get them into the chat, and we'll try to figure out and do it as quick as we can. Um, but we, this is really about successes with undergraduate researchers, um, discussing your own observations, student experiences. I actually see this taking place in the chat already. Um, and where CER fits in. So I see the rooms are opening. Hi, Kathy. Sorry. Um, 
We'd love to have you share. Um, I don't think we have time for a, a full share out, but we'll just go. We'll keep using that chat or Twitter uh, with that hashtag easily on our slides on every single one of them for you. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we'd love to hear some of the ideas that you talked about related to undergraduate. Uh, research, um, your observations of students' experiences, and what we still need to know. I already saw some conversations starting in the chat about variations in experiences, so we'd just love to hear from you if you want to drop in the chat. And um, I think this is kind of our final bit. We'll, of course, hang back for questions, but Catherine, I'll let you, or Kathy, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll let you uh, kind of, if you have more to say, I don't want to. Okay, oh, great. Yeah, yeah. Um, so as chat are coming in. I'm also going to drop in, and I, if someone could confirm that this works, a Google form that you don't have to fill out, but if anyone would like to contribute thoughts from today, um, you can put those in there, and we're going to compile it, and I've already confirmed with this with Catherine that after we compile it, we can share it with her, and it'll go out to participants to be an additional resource. Um, yeah, so just a few of the points, I'm going to read some of them out for, I know we're all reading them, but for those watching this recording later, it might take a few years for us to fully learn about everything that happened over the past year. Yes, complete agree, absolutely. Um, one group, Annabelle's group, uh, talked about the positive effects of the pandemic. What? Uh, bringing CER's creativity to the forefront in finding ways to teach and then how those efforts could be appreciated by students. So that's a really nice feedback loop, she says, that when that happens, um, or when they say, they say that. Um, right. Student experiences were massively different. That's a very, very good point. Thanks for sharing that, Bruce. So we might... Uh, might be a very heterogeneous experience um, set. Oh, students are unsure why projects would be good for their career. Yeah, that's a big one. Um, I hope they see can see, we can explain why that would be the case. More freedom from the pandemic to be creative and instigate innovations that may have been blocked before. That's very interesting. Um, Ed research would be more feasible maybe during the pandemic, but it was just very difficult for students, well, and everyone to be productive. Oh, yeah, snaps. That's that's me upping that one just unilaterally. I'm seeing quite a lot of likes and things on that. Okay, I think this is coming from Stacy and I, I want to read it out loud if that's okay. Or um, Stacy, are you are you able to demic and read your own comment out loud so we can get your voice instead? Uh, am I the only Stacy? This is Stacy. Oh, regret. that's a good point. Sorry, I was just looking at the most recent comment. Yeah, uh, I I put in the chat that I'm going to be brutally honest and make space for this to be okay, or let others in the community know they're not alone. The question is framed around successes, and I simply did not have the bandwidth to provide the meaningful experience for undergrads that I typically do in my group, so I did not. I simply said, I cannot do this. I said no and was honest about my own personal professional limitations, and that's not great. It also means my graduate students didn't get the chance to help co-mentor those undergrads, but it is one of the casualties of the last 14 months, so. No, absolutely, and thank you for sharing that. I think um, that's a really important thing to share, but also an important acknowledgement that we do have to make choices. Uh, and I think that, you know, that's something that certainly our prompts didn't really capture. Laura, do you want to add anything, given your, your time spent looking at well-being and joy? <laughs> I did. I unmuted because I was looking at the chat and just a conversation taking place about well-being. Um, so I, I see, I think, Madeline, you, you noted that you're not able to get ethics approval. Um, I find that, I mean, well, I, how frustrating. We'll leave it there. Um, but I, at my institution, I did collect data from students. Um, I did a, a small study called Navigating College During a Pandemic that was explicitly asking about mental well-being and their transitions. Um, and then I led focus groups as a STEM off the survey. And I just, yeah, I think I think there was another comment that mentioned student resiliency, but also student struggles. And what I found and what many of you seem to be indicating is it's both, right? Um, but I think we also have to honor our own well-being. There's a reason I taught a class on joy this spring that was mentioned at the top. Um, that was like my own personal, um, I'm, we're, I'm fortunate to, you know, 
have this writing teaching that I'm doing that I can kind of channel different themes. And I was like, I just need something good, <laughs> um, something that's going to make me feel good uh, and make students feel good. And we ended up with a really beautiful class that um, students shared, you know, just help them. So I encourage you all on your campuses, even conversations openly about well-being um, can be really transformative. Just helping students recognize that they're not alone in this space, I think, has been the major theme that I've seen from both my research and my teaching with students. Um, that I think it's wonderful to share our own limitations and that I, I, you know, just kind of recognize and recognize our limits and model that to students. So through that well-being struggle, you know, they, they feel supported in that way as well. Yeah, great. Thanks for adding that perspective, Laura. And I've dropped in the chat because she wouldn't, I know, um, because she's quite modest, uh, an article that our university put out on her JOY class, in case you're wondering about more details, as well as the report out form again. Again, totally optional. And if you want to put your name to things, you, to you can. Um, but I think I see Catherine's video on again, and I think that's our cue that we're wrapping up. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions for Kathy and Laura? <laughs> 